So when it comes to the ketogenic diet, there's a lot of things I wish I would have known earlier. So I started this in 2015, it's 2019 when we record this video. So I'm gonna share with you five key takeaways that gosh, I wish I would have known earlier. We're gonna dive into it. So the first key takeaway that gosh, I wish I would have known back in 2015 when I started the ketogenic diet was that you don't need to have a meal every two to three hours. You see, when I first got into this in 2015, thanks to my friend Alessandro Ferretti, you know, I didn't know that this so-called second meal effect, I didn't know that, you know, that fat metabolism is much more energy intensive, that it takes a long time to break down and emulsify fat. So I was eating every two or three hours. I felt bloated, I felt gassy, I had constipation, and I was trying to figure out what was going on. And once I came across this research that I'll talk about in another video, the so-called second meal effect and how you know, really fatty acid breakdown and absorption takes a long time, I realized that, you know what, I have to just have like one or two major meals. And that, that lends itself, and we'll talk about later, to the ketogenic process and ketone synthesis anyway. So that's a big take-home message, friends, is if you're trying to be keto, you need to compress your feeding window and not have as many meals and as many snacks, okay? So I know a lot of people kind of come into this from various diets and they're eating every two to three hours and that's gonna be hard with keto due to the second meal effect. So big take home here, have one or two major meals. If you really need to have a snack or a post-workout shake, if you're physically active, then you can have a little bit more outside of that. But we generally find that people benefit uh, from doing that, okay? In, in terms of just not having multiple meals and multiple snacks. So that's a big take home number one. Big take home number two is overcoming our fear of gluconeogenesis. Okay, now I'm sure you've heard of this word before. We've talked about this on the channel. Other videos talk about this. So gluconeogenesis, if you break down the word, it's creating glucose from anew. So I have good news and bad news. The bad news is gluconeogenesis is happening if you're in ketosis. Let me say that again. So if you're in a ketogenic state, your body's making ketones, the, the pathways for ketogenesis and gluconeogenesis are parallel. The good news is, that's bad news if you think it's bad news, the good news is you don't need to worry about it, right? Because there's obligate glucose utilizing cells within your body. Your red blood cells can't utilize fats or ketones. They don't have a mitochondria, right? There's various neurons, there's various, uh, I, th I believe the retinal cells absolutely require glucose. So again, you don't need to be scared of gluconeogenesis. I know a lot of people, when keto first started coming out back in, you know, first started becoming popular in 2014, 2015, a lot of people were scared about this. Please don't be scared about this. Now, you should be scared of very high glucose levels because that means that maybe something is not occurring, maybe you're not able to, to make ketones. And this happens with people with fatty liver. And so this is another kind of small little side tip. It's not part of the big five that we're gonna talk about today, but if you're embarking on a ketogenic diet and you're testing your glucose and ketones, which is very helpful, I recommend people do test initially to figure out where they're at, especially looking at both ketones and glucose to see where glucose is at in relation to ketones because you don't necessarily want high glucose and high ketones together. What you really want is moderate or little bumps in ketones and low glucose. And so that means your body's utilizing fat instead of sugar, making the so-called metabolic switch that a lot of us are striving for. So long story short, you don't need to be scared about gluconeogenesis. It's happening, but I do recommend testing your glucose and ketones because that's where you're gonna see aberrations and things going wrong. One thing, for example, individuals that have genetic aberrations in the ability to make ketones can occur, and there's an enzyme, HMG-CoA lyase and CoA synthase, that's highly prevalent in terms of its variability in individuals of Portuguese or Saudi Arabian descent. So a problem where you would see the inability to make ketones could be a very high glucose and low ketones, uh, and that would be problematic. That would be kind of an alarm signal where your body's saying, well, we're not able to fully utilize fats and ketones for fuel, so there's a compensatory upregulation in glucose. And when I say high, I would say glucose over 125 milligrams per DL. That would be, well, if something's kind of going on wrong here, and you might need to you know, just work with a healthcare practitioner in that context. This is a rare thing, but we do see this, and there is genetic evidence to support the fact that, again, individuals of Saudi Arabian descent and Portuguese descent have a variability in this rate-limiting enzyme that synthesizes and makes ketones, and so you, you wanna consider that. And so the third thing that I wish I would've known earlier is to have more salt. And I think salt is kind of like dietary cholesterol and dietary fat. We've been told for a long time that we need to have low sodium diets. Sodium is linked to 
you know, high blood pressure and all these different things. But, you know, thanks to Dr. James DiNicolantonio, who I'm very grateful for. We've had him on the show twice now. He's just a great person, scientist. Uh, he's a, a doctor of pharmacy, but does a lot of, you know, scientific studies and publications, things along those lines. You know, he recommends north of five grams of real salt per day. Physically active people, if you're in the sauna, if it's summertime, if you're sweating a lot, if you're working out a lot, you might need more than that. I, so don't be scared of salt, and especially if you're fasting periodically as well. As we've talked about in other videos, in the first 48 hours of a fast, the sodium excretion in the urine is quite significant. And so if you're doing a lot of fasting or even prolonged fasting, one tip that I could offer to you is increasing your salt intake. And so I recommend just using salt liberally on food. And so being okay with, you know, just pouring salt on, on your eggs, on your guacamole. My daughter, by the way, loves avocado with a little salt on there. It tastes amazing. It's a, it's a good, uh, good thing to have during meals. And so the fourth thing that I wish I would have known earlier is to not be fearful of carbohydrates. You know, it's natural. When you first embark on this ketogenic diet way of eating and this lifestyle, is you're kind of fearful of carbohydrates. You're like, oh no, those carbs, I can't have carbs, I'm keto. Well, okay, I understand the first 12, 14 weeks, maybe even the first three or four months, really avoiding the carbohydrates. But as we're filming this video, it's the summertime and we're getting into the fall where berries are gonna be in, in season, squashes, a lot of, you know, I think healthy carbohydrates that many of us can afford to eat if we're physically active. And so that's why I encourage you to embark on a ketogenic lifestyle, not just a diet, where you're changing both your exercise, your feeding window, your sleep patterns and all that so that you don't need to be so scared of carbohydrates. Now that doesn't mean that you should have bread and crackers and cookies and treats and brownies, right? Because those are usually containing unhealthy carbohydrates, sugar, highly processed, highly refined. But if you're physically active and eating in-season carbohydrates, you'll be surprised at how consuming those things, especially on days where you're doing a lot of activity, how that doesn't necessarily totally negate the ability to get into ketosis. So I wish I would have known that earlier because I was very kind of dogmatic about my approach, you know, to try to be in ketosis. And I took a step back and realized that that's, you know, I don't have a disease necessarily that I'm trying to manage. I'm just trying to optimize health. And I found that sprinkling in seasonally available carbohydrates on days where I'm more active actually help my body perform better. And so again, I wish I wasn't so dogmatic about that. I see people being dogmatic about that. So long story short, unless you have an autoimmune flare up or a lot of GI issues when you have carbohydrates or you notice that your blood sugar fluctuates crazily, uh, then, then I wouldn't be so scared of, of moderately consuming carbohydrates based upon your activity level. And the fifth tip that I would recommend, and I learned this from Alessandro Freddi, I've learned so much as you can tell by now by watching these videos, is that on a ketogenic diet, you may not need to have as many calories as you do on other higher carbohydrate or high protein style diets. Part of that, and Alessandro Ferretti and Waco have created this app, MitoCalc, I believe is the name of the app, and they figured out that when you're in ketosis, there's less heat lost as energy in the so-called Krebs cycle. And so what we know is that different machines operate at different efficiencies, and that's why there's low octane gas and high octane gas. High octane gas enables different machines like jets and cars and so forth to operate at a higher efficiency. Well, it turns out that if you're utilizing fats and ketones for energy, it may be that there's less energy lost as heat. There's less entropy being liberated. And so you, know, you may need to adjust your calorie intake and you might be able to thrive on lower calorie intakes on a, if you're totally ketogenic or fat adapted. So I don't have any randomized placebo controlled studies to share with you at this particular time, but just know that that is being talked about by people that are studying the mitochondrial bioenergetics and looking at uh, energy loss as heat and so forth and water in the mitochondria. So those are some of the tips that I wish I would have known earlier. Hopefully they help you in your ketogenic diet and lifestyle journey. And if you enjoyed this content, please hit that like button. If you're not yet subscribed, please do so because we have one-off videos where it's just me talking like this, but we also interview experts that I think you might learn a few tips and tricks from uh, in, in the past and upcoming videos. So thanks so much as always for tuning in. We'll catch you in the next one. Peace guys.